Hello, my friend, Dan Schulman. There is no CEO I'd rather talk to than you about the opportunity for economic inclusion in this country. And of course, the challenges. The challenges are real in a world and a nation where inequality is actually growing. The top 1% uh, own 43% of the world's wealth. We know the history in our country of redlining, of asset stripping, of predatory lending that has worked against the aspirations you and I have of economic inclusion. I'd like you to talk about uh, how you think capitalism needs to be improved, uh, needs to be addressed in a way that uh, generates more economic inclusion, more shared prosperity. Well, Darren, it's so great to be with you. It's always great to see you. Can't wait to see you in person uh, as well. Um, and you're right, we share um, a set of common beliefs. Um, and, you know, I've said publicly many times that I think that capitalism needs an upgrade. Um, I'm a fan of capitalism. I don't know a better economic system, but that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be improved. It clearly does. Too many people in our country around the world are being left behind. And I think the pandemic only exposed that with more ferocity. Um, and you know, there's something like 185 million people in the US that are financially stressed they struggle every single month to make ends meet. Um, and that, that does not bode well for our democracy. You know, if you think about it, people you know, need to think about that the system is working for them. If they work hard, they'll get ahead. Their kids will have a better life than they do. And if they feel that isn't happening, they tend to radicalize. They tend to work against the system, both on the left and the right. And that is dangerous not just for our economy, but for our system of governance. And so I'm a, a big believer that we need to uh, be more than just shareholder focused as a corporation. We need to think about things from a multi-constituency basis. We don't operate in a bubble as a corporation. We're part of our communities. And so I firmly believe we need to stand up we need to address the shortcomings of capitalism. And I think we all have a responsibility to go and do that. I mean, I know you think about this all the time, Darren. I'm curious about your thoughts. Like, you know, what do we need to do going forward? How do corporations need to think about this? What's the role of corporate governance? And what's the role of like board diversity and leadership diversity in companies? Like how important is that as we think about a, uh, a future that is more equal than the one we've had in the past. Well, there's no doubt that we won't get to economic inclusion if we don't have an economic system itself that is more inclusive and more diverse. And of course, we have to think about, uh, and that really begins with the, the uh, manifestation of uh, our economy and American style capitalism, which is the corporation, whether that is public or private, the enterprise, whether it's public or private, and governance. That governance has been uh, historically pretty narrowly limited to uh, white men um, and more recently women, um, but very few uh, people of color. And I think we're not going to get there without diversifying. So we need to look at the board structures. We need to look at uh, the, the composition of boards. Uh, it's good that policy like the NASDAQ policy, like the policy in the state of California mandating diversity, um, that that is going to actually get us um, um, part of the way there. But ultimately, this can't be performative. As you well know, uh, this has to be felt genuinely and authentically by leaders uh, of, of our enterprises, whether they be public and private or private. And in your case, we have talked about the public, uh, 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 but the privates are also very important. Um, uh, private uh, equity uh, owns literally thousands of companies that employs millions of people. Uh, we don't ever talk about 
um, the uh, governance of those uh, entities, but we need to talk about them because they're critical. Um, but we also have to talk about policy. Capitalism uh, does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, capitalism and public policy interact in a democracy. And I'm always challenged by this idea of the, the, the tension between capitalism and democracy. Democracy must win. Uh, democracy must win. And if capitalism, as you have talked about so eloquently, undermines democracy, undermines our collective uh, uh, common uh, uh, aspirations, then we are going to be uh, really, uh, as a nation, uh, uh, imperiled. Now, I know when you took over PayPal, one of the things you did was to really uh, look in the mirror as a company and ask yourself uh, about the, your policies around economic inclusion and the financial health and wellness of your staff, your employees. Um, and you, you had some really tough conversations uh, with the C-suite, with your board, and you, you did some pretty radical things that many of your peers were not doing. Talk about that journey. Aaron, I love talking to you because I always learn something every time I, I listen to you uh, and it kind of refines my, uh, my point of view and how I think about things. Um, look, you know, I, we had a really fortunate opportunity when we spun off from eBay because we could redefine um, the company. And the single sentence that inspired me and the rest of the executive team was this one, that it is expensive to be poor. And that could not be more true, unfortunately. Wait, Dan, you just hold on. I just have to, to hear the CEO of a major Fortune 100, 100 company say, it is expensive to be poor. That is a profound statement. Yeah, I mean, it It drives everything. I mean, it is, it's kind of backwards from what you would think, right? The more affluent to cash a check or pay a bill or send money to somebody they live, costs them almost nothing. And they can do it instantaneously. If you're less affluent, if you're outside the system, and I told you already how many people are less affluent. It's the majority of our country. Those same transactions don't cost two times more, three times more. They can go from 20 bips to 600 bips, 800 bips for the same transaction. And so you have those that are uh, underserved. They spend almost $140 billion a year on unnecessary fees and high interest rates. And my view was that the mission of PayPal had to be to address that imbalance, that what frustrated me and excited me about our mission is that I think there is a solution rooted in technology in which we can make those same transactions much more affordable, avoid people standing in line for 30 minutes to do these transactions. I mean, being outside the system and paying your bills and managing and moving your money is practically a part-time job if you're not part of the system. And so I did not want to separate out ESG from the business of the company, like set up you know, a, a separate you know, foundation where we would give some money, by the way, all great things to go do, but that isn't like what makes you socially responsible and progressive as a company. Your products and services themselves need to be focused on your mission. Like just one quick thing, we do working capital to small businesses. 70% of our working capital loans go to the 10% of counties where 10 or more banks have closed branches. Those those areas are always where the medium income is below the national average. And, and those are predominantly um, communities that are underserved, people of color, and they absolutely need working capital because by the way, when we loan them that working capital, 
their average sales go up by 21 to 22 percent. And so versus those in the control group that go up one to two percent. And so having your products be a part of your mission, and then later on we'll talk about how values support that mission, is the way that you attract the very best people to your company. And if you attract the very best, the most diverse talent, you pay them well, you respect them, then you're going to do well as a company over the medium to long term. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, it's just part and parcel of the mission of PayPal. But you're really talking about this idea that every person, but in, in your case, every consumer has a right to uh, live with dignity. Yeah. Uh, that that the, the predatory system uh, of finance for low-income Americans um, strips them of their dignity. I mean, as you say, if you have to stand in line 30 minutes to cast a check, if you have to, in order just to go get week to week, be engaged in this financial services ecosystem that is it basically dehumanizing. This is an example. I mean, you know, I, as you know, I can be cynical about <laughs> technology uh, based solutions uh, yeah. because a, a lot of uh, your friends out uh, there in Silicon Valley are proselytizing that uh, they are, that they've got the uh, solution to everything. But in this case, technology truly is the, the, the gap closer. Uh, uh, it unlocks the solution to how you actually give the consumer dignity in the financial marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think foundationally, um, people need to have financial health. They have to have it. If they don't have financial health, everything builds from there. Um, and so I think this is, as we talked about at the very beginning, this is fundamental to our economy and our democracy. And I think this is just a matter of like people thinking like very short term, or do you, are you thinking more medium and long term? And you know, most companies that aspire to move from good to great have to think about things over the medium to the long term. It's easy to maximize profits next quarter, but that is not our responsibility as a company. It's how do we build an environment and a company that supports that over the medium and long term that lifts all of us up. Well, I think you uh, have to really uh, speak truth like this to your fellow CEOs. And we have to talk about the incentives that make it harder for the good CEOs who share your philosophy, but might be in a different industry where uh, they're really focused on what the quarterly earnings report is going to be and what the Wall Street uh, cohort of analysts who cover them are going to say uh, about the short term. And so I think we all are really struggling uh, with this short termism and we're seeing the, uh, the implications of it in our, in our economy. We're seeing uh, how the supply chain um, does not have redundancy because we didn't invest. Uh, because often uh, efficiency uh, uh, analytics uh, and, and, and those who would criticize uh, companies for being inefficient stopped investing in, in redundant um, supports that would make it possible to not have um, the disruption that we're seeing in some industries today. That, that is a reality. Now, as we get uh, close to the end here, I wanna talk to you about leadership. And, uh, and the particular kind of leadership uh, that you've exerted, that you have uh, during your tenure demonstrated the power of, um, what's your message to those other leaders who would say, oh, Dan's lucky because he's in FinTech and those guys are a different uh, sector than a we old a legacy uh, 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 CPG companies or something, or he's, he gets to march to a different beat because Dan is, is special and PayPal is in a, a class of itself. Um, what's your message to those men and women leaders? Yeah. 
Well, I'm a big believer that profit and purpose are not at odds with each other, that they're actually complementary. Um, that the single biggest competitive advantage that a company has is the strength of its employees. Can you attract the very best employees to your company? Do they believe in what you're trying to go do? Do they have a passion around it? Do you treat them with respect? Do you uh, make sure that not just their physical health, but their mental health and their financial health are all taken care of? Because if you can do that, then you create competitive advantage in whatever industry you are. Because there is a war for talent out there, uh, Darren. We all face it. It doesn't matter what industry we're in. And I think that um, employees want to believe in the mission of a company and they want to believe that it has a set of values that are not just words on a wall, but that we live up to every single day. And, you know, that's not easy for CEOs and leaders. Our jobs are much more difficult than they were when all we had to think about or all we thought we had to think about was shareholder primacy. Like you cannot avoid the cultural wars that go around. You have to have a set of values that informs your actions every day. You know, we withdrew from North Carolina when they passed House Bill 2, which we felt allowed for the discrimination of somebody because of their sexual orientation or sexual identity. We stood up against the immigration bill. You know, we uh, post the death of George Floyd and so many others. We said, you know what? This can't be a moment in time. It has to be a movement over time. We need to be a part of the fight. And that's why we put up $535 million to battle <clears throat> the racial wealth gap that is the same today as it was back in the 1960s. And so I think doing this, and standing up and having a mission and a set of values that drive your actions um, is the right thing for every company to do because it attracts the right employees. They're engaged and energized. And this is the way we lift like companies up, our sectors up, our economy up, and our democracy. That's right. But you know, it's interesting. Uh, you uh, I would also add a dimension, certainly when I think about uh, you, uh, and that's the dimension of moral leadership. Uh, yes, it's a war uh, for talent, and yes, it will in near to the to the uh, ROI um, EPS, no doubt. But we need in this country moral leaders, and I don't mean moralizing, proselytizing yeah. leaders. I mean leaders who stand for something and operate from a place of grace and generosity and love. And we don't hear leaders talking about that very much. Uh, and I think that's a shame because I think our, our people, uh, our stakeholders want authentic leaders who genuinely are who they are, vulnerable human beings who are flawed, who are not perfect, but who seek to serve. We don't hear enough about this idea that we are here to serve. I feel every day that I am so fortunate to serve the Ford Foundation and its mission, the grantees and the stakeholders and the legacy of the Ford Foundation. So I just wanna just put a little pin on that. And I wanna close, Dan, because I know uh, the work that you have done at PayPal and beyond has really set you apart. And I'd love for you just to, um, with me, reflect on briefly uh, the journey and the go forward. And I will just say on the issue of hope, I am hopeful. Uh, I believe that hope is the oxygen of our democracy. And there is no doubt that 
this nation uh, needs hope. And I uh, know that you join me because you too believe in this idea of uh, the American dream. And I'm reminded that we're the only nation that has the word dream attached to it. Mm -hmm. The American dream cannot be lost. Our democracy cannot be lost. And leaders like you, Dan Shulman, give me hope that uh, the future can be bright and that this challenge of economic inclusion is not a mirage, but can be a reality. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Darren. Appreciate it. It's always great to be with you. Thanks.